Thank you for being here with us today, Larry. Thank you. Um, so, Larry, if you could just speak a bit about an example of an intervention where the government decided it had to fill a gap or kind of another intervention that focuses on scaling through the public sector. So I'll differentiate two different approaches to this. I know you've talked to Santiago Levy, and he's as good an example as I know of one of these, these approaches. And that's the approach where the public sector itself realizes it has a gap and initiates a solution to that. His, his effort with Oportunidades in Mexico is precisely that. They followed the steps that I think any consultant on scaling would have suggested, but they did it as the government consulting to itself and implementing on its own behalf. The more common situation that we find ourselves in as a scaling community is when there's some external intervention that imagines or knows that the government is the appropriate way to scale this if it were to go to scale at all. And that's typically things that start on a project basis and, tip, and very often start with externally the foundation or official development assistance support. If you wanted to look at these across an array of sectors, what you'd see is that the education sector is the most extreme version of this because in almost every country on the globe, the only body set up to deliver education outcomes at scale is the public sector often complemented by, say, private or parochial schools, but never carried exclusively by private or parochial schools. So if you see an education intervention that intends to or aspires to scale, you can almost count on the fact that it's got its mind set on trying to somehow become part of the, what the government offers. So if you're scanning for government-led scaling efforts, you can find them in every sector, but probably none more obviously than the education sector. So do any particular examples come to mind when you think of successful programs um, that have done that? I can think of lots. Uh, I'll mention a couple. I'm just back now from Tanzania where I'm working with efforts to scale something called Learner Guides, which are being implemented by an NGO called CAMFED, an extraordinarily good NGO headquartered primarily in the UK. And what it started out doing was scholarship programs for rural poor girls in southern Africa, particularly Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Tanzania. And there are now hundreds of thousands of young women who finish school thanks to scholarships that CAMFED was able to put together for them. What they realized was that the people coming through these programs were themselves an important asset. And so the idea is what could we both help them to do that, and also use them to do that would serve a public purpose as well as helping to advance their own careers and lives. And one of the things CAMFIT came up with is this idea of trying to use these young women as volunteers going back into the school system, often the same school they graduated from, to teach life skills to Form 1 students. In that situation, and I must tell you, if you see this, this is quite extraordinary what they do, getting people talking about things like being pressured into sex, uh, the idea of human agency and taking control of your own life, and so on. To watch young people lead young people in discussions about that is really something to behold. But having now reached quite a large scale in, in Tanzania, they're looking to the possibility of going national with this. Up to this point, it's through government schools, but it's really a CAMFED-led program. And CAMFED and the young women who graduated are the staffing for the program in support of the school system, but not organized, managed, or funded by the school system. If this was to go national, it would have to make a complete flip on that. And it would have to be the governments that are authorizing, capacitating, leading, and to some extent funding the effort. Just to give you a sense, CAMFED now, with the current phase of expansion, is in about 9% of the schools. So that means going from 9 to 100, you can, you can see, you could imagine a model where CAMFED would just keep growing and growing and growing, but nobody, including CAMFED, thinks that's the right way to solve the problem. So part of the, the planning process there is to figure out, if it were to go to scale, what role would that mean for the government, what would have to happen between here and there, and would there be a remaining role for CAMFED? If so, what would that role be, and how would that be funded? So that's the exercise that they're in the middle of right now. Just to spin that out a tiny bit more, if you think about it, you have questions from top to bottom associated 
who even conven convenes a discussion on that? Is it the government inviting in CAMFED or CAMFED inviting in the government? And so, right, there's going to be a launch of this event, of this, of this whole exercise in, uh, in Tanzania in late March. And the question under discussion right now with the government includes exactly that. Is this the government's event that CAMFED's participating in or the reverse? I could go on at length about that, but let me switch to another one. The other one I'm going to pick it just happens coincidentally to be in Eastern Africa also. It's something run by an organization called STIR, which started in India uh, and then spread to Uganda. And it works on, again, education sector, but the issue of teacher motivation. And their notion is that intrinsic motivation of teachers is both an important asset and something that can be cultivated. So they've had a very impressive program in India, in parts of India, and also now in Uganda, in, I would say, in almost full partnership with the government of Uganda. I say almost full partnership because I think it started out in a more conventional way, with STIR taking the strong lead, but in frequent dialogue with the government of Uganda. It's now moved, I would say, two-thirds of the way to the government of Uganda seeing this as an initiative of its own that STIR is supporting. Again, as you might imagine, there are a whole series of issues involved in how to do that and who needs to do what to make that happen, but it's another, I think, good example in the education sector of how things start outside of government can eventually hope to find their way inside. Okay, so can you talk a little bit more about some of the challenges um, that such initiatives that are trying to partner with the public sector face as they go about this um, beyond that ownership piece? I'll give you three or four. So a lot, first of all, most of the things that start outside, and particularly the ones that start under the auspices of a, uh, a very mission-driven NGO, find themselves with a supervision structure, often a funding structure, uh, and, and often a, how would I say it, a kind of a delivery modality that depends on uh, strong commitment, motivation, often voluntarism, uh, often self-accountability on things, uh, and a management and kind of a high-touch system as a, supplied by the, the implementing partner. All of those things, everything I just mentioned, is difficult to reproduce in a government context. So when you imagine the situation of the government being the lead entity, not only in authorizing this, but in delivering it, you say, well, how do these people get chosen? Are they still volunteers? How do you do things at that kind of numbers and maintain any kind of fidelity to it, and not just a hollowed out implementation of this? The two things I, I happen to mention to you, both the CAMFED one and the STIR one, depend a lot on behavioral change, not just on, for example, using a tablet instead of a, a chalkboard. And so the more you try to f scale up things that are really systemic or behavioral sorts of things, the more challenging it is to imagine how the, the, those same functions are delivered not only at scale, but delivered by governments, which by their nature tend to be more bureaucratic and, uh, how would I say it, more uh, cut and dried and, and um, procedural in the way they do the things that they, that they do. So the, there's no difficulty, I don't believe, in reaching concurrence around the ends, around the intention of the program. But when you start thinking about the actual delivery of the program, there are major issues about who's well equipped by comparative advantage to do what. So I'm of the opinion that in a number of these, even when it goes to scale, even when it's delivered nationally, and even when the people who deliver it end up eventually being, for example, public servants, there's a role for that third party, whether it's quality control, conscience, occasional oversight that is going to be necessary in order to maintain the, the thing that made it work in the first place. So that's one set of, of issues. A second set of issues is that the public sector, even if it is the one that's got the budget to do this kind of thing and the mandate and the reach, it's usually very stretched. And when you implement something, anything, 
new, there's a question of opportunity cost. Where are the resources going to come from for that? So it's not enough to say that it's cost effective. It needs to be able to beat the competition for those same resources. And not only the competition in terms of a, what you might think of as an analytical perspective, but every piece of that competition has a current constituency. So for example, if you were going to move something out of the current mandate of the public sector in order to make room for this, you would have to somehow not only make the case to the funding parties, but overcome the opposition of the people who are running whatever it is that you would be displacing in order to, to do this. So I think that's one easily overlooked case, because when you're, when you're dealing with, with new programming that's donor-led, you tend to focus on beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries. But when you move to policy change by government, you move to a world of winners and losers. In other words, it's, you're not just a non-beneficiary, you're potentially somebody whose interests are adversely affected by the, by the change, and that's predictable resistance. Not only that, but school systems, I'm staying in education for the moment, school systems, but I could say the same thing about health systems or agricultural systems or water systems, those systems have ways of doing things, and there's a major cost to change, even positive change. And trying to get both the concurrence and to overcome what I think is a fairly substantial decay factor you initially hit when you do one of these changes is a major issue. I'll mention just one more thing, which is that when you phase something new in, whether it's meeting a problem that wasn't being addressed before or meeting an old problem in a new way, there's a period of time during which you almost always need to have the old system running alongside the new system. Uh, ironically, it means that both for that reason and because there are costs involved in bringing in the new system, transition costs, you have typically a bulge in financing. In other words, costs go up before they hopefully at some point go down. So even the interventions that have the, the eventual effect of reducing unit costs have the short-term effect of increasing unit costs. So there's a, from the government's point of view, there's usually a bridge financing issue that goes with this as well that needs to have a solution. Mm -hmm. So going back to those two um, particular examples that you mentioned, um, could we talk about the financing for each of them a little bit in terms of how they went about getting the fiscal mm -hmm. space? So in the case of the CAMFED uh, situation, the initial funding was CAMFED raised through charitable contributions, as far as I know. The, the next phase, which is the current phase, is being funded through a project uh, assisted by DFID. DFID took the original CAMFED success in, uh, in, this, in a certain number of districts and said, so we wanted you to go to a larger number of districts, including areas where you don't yet have uh, CAMFED graduates. So you're going to need to recruit your your learner guides from a population not of your own ex-beneficiaries, but in another way. They wanted to see both uh, the viability of transporting the model and they simply had geographies they wanted to see it covered. So that's the second phase. But the national phase would require it to go from, as I said, from what's including both those phases, 9% of the schools, to the full 100%. Of schools. At that point, there's not going to be a DFID and there's not going to be a CAMFED that can fund that. At that point, the only viable option is that the country funds that. So when you think about that, the, the, I would say this has been relatively, not quite, but relatively free of charge to the country so far. Now, I, the reason I say not entirely is they've had to provide supervision structures through the schools, they've had to do certain things. But most of the costs have been borne by others in this. I think that the country's commitment to it is genuine, but that noun would need to turn into a budget appropriation for this that they haven't had to do so far. So part of the, the issue, and this is something, again, I think people really don't give enough attention to usually on scaling where government is the intentional, is the intended long-term pro provider at scale, Unit cost becomes terribly important, and the actual budget from which that cost comes is equally important. 
So part of the, the next phase of the CAMFED work in, in Tanzania is working hard to both uh, document and reduce unit costs and becoming extremely clear with the government where in the government's budget that cost would have to be borne if the government were going to do this at scale. The STIR situation is a little bit different. STIR is, again, operating at the moment with its funding being provided externally through the, this NGO, which is uh, housed in Britain but operates in India and, and in um, Uganda. Uh, but they are already trying to work with the ministry on a nationwide application of this. So the, the costs are now being borne, I believe it's half and half, by the government of Uganda and external parties with the intention of that transition, I believe, to 100% internally funded. So that it comes down to really very concrete details. When there's a convening, who pays for the convening? When there are transportation costs for the teachers, who pays for the transportation costs for the teachers? The absolute intention of STIR and the partial current reality is that those costs be borne by the government of Uganda. Mm -hmm. And as these were, um as they're in the process of being scaled and as they're in the process of becoming national, um, can you just talk a little bit about if there's room for learning, if there's any room for experimentation, if there's any room for adaptation, and what the challenges are with that? Well, as you know, and as anybody who works on scaling knows, the pathway to scale is never a straight one. And there is no route, that, no successful route, that doesn't involve a lot of iteration and learning. So that's an important question that you ask because I think if you had to generalize, you'd say governments as a whole are not really built for that kind of iteration. They're built for consistent delivery of, a, of an outcome. Uh, in the cases that I've mentioned, it's a little too soon to say because in both cases there's a really prominent role for the NGO, and in both cases the NGOs have been very good about learning. Uh, but I do think it's a challenge to try and make sure that that function isn't prematurely cut off in terms of simply a mechanical rolling out of something. And in the case of the, the CAMFED example, I can give you a very specific strategy, which is together with uh, Brookings, something called Millions Learning, I'm helping them to institute something we're calling a real-time scaling lab, which is a, an entity, not a physical entity, but a staffed function inside the rollout that will be constantly looking at the scaling issue and that learning group will be not only a prominent representation from but we hope will be convened by the government of Tanzania. So the idea is Brookings Camp Fed Government of Tanzania led by Government of Tanzania to have an accompaniment with the, the scaling process, you could call it an embedding of, an, of a learning function inside the scaling process, the specific purpose of which is to tend to the question that, that you raise. But that's in part in place precisely because we know those things don't usually happen. And so if we were giving advice to somebody, we would say, if it's not that, create something like that. Because uh, as maybe you've heard me say before, typically the pathway to scale, even when it's good, is something like 15 years. And during those 15 years, what you see is a lot of switchbacks. The changes, the learning are about two things. Sometimes it's about the scaling strategy, but sometimes it's about the intervention itself. Because usually the intervention, no matter what it is, pick the learner guides or pick the, the teacher motivation protocols, they end up merging with, once they become mainstream, they merge with other functions that are already happening. They don't, it doesn't remain usually a standalone scale up. It, so that integration means that the, the framing of the learning as well as who's doing it needs to change. For example, in, in Uganda, I'm sure it's going to end up being the school inspectorate that has this job because this is going to end up being part of the way the government of Uganda interacts with teachers, not just around around motivation, but around content and around a whole series of, of other things. It, it could be the case that the, 
the support structure for this particular STIR intervention remains separate and parallel, but that's probably not the best solution. And likewise, if you go back to, to Tanzania and you ask that question, the life skills program being run by the Learner Guides is wonderful, but it's not the only thing that's going on in those schools. And so if the government really decided to make that part of its program, it would probably take the support for that and merge it in with whatever kind of teacher support or school support it's doing on other quarters, from other quarters. And I give you yet another angle on that. So in Tanzania, this life skills work, as I said, is happening thanks to CAMFED in the schools. But the government, under UNICEF auspices, is doing something very similar for outer school children. Well, maybe the better long-term solution as these progress is to bring some those two things together, the in-school and the out-of-school. Well, that would again cause, be occasion for a different learning group and a different implementation group. And you would see that, as I would see that, as progress, not as a step away from the fidelity of the model. Mm -hmm. So on that note, too, um, another question we have is just, how do you know that you are scaling the model you designed? And is that ever an issue if it moves away from what it initially was mm -hmm. as it goes through that process? These are really good questions. The, so uh, you would get within the scaling community different answers to that. Myself, I'm a strong proponent of adaptation, and I'm not very zealous about fidelity. Uh, so I would say so long as the solution continues to meet the outcome objectives of the original intervention, it's perfectly fine with me. In fact, it would, again, represent in many cases learning for it to lose similarity in some regards to what it started out being. It started out being a very controlled interaction that was standalone for a discrete set of, of people in a confined space over a particular period of time implemented by one set of actors. Well, why would you think none of that would change as you, as you move forward? In almost every case I can imagine, it should change. So then the question becomes, well, then by what, by what calculus and who decides if the change is within the acceptable band of, of adaptation or is just somehow discarding? The original idea. And I say being really clear about the outcomes is the right way to, to do that and having some either learning or oversight function in place that has authority and, and mandate to look at those, in most cases I would say not less than twice a year, uh, and to at least correct a, an inadvertent diversion from, having, from happening but not trying to simply muscle everything into compliance. Mm -hmm. And as we're talking about these two examples too, and um, kind of going through their own processes too, um, how do you think that these two examples will maintain long-term support of what they're trying to do, um, given factors like political turnover and given uncertainty um, as well? Well, I think we don't know, is the honest answer. The, they're both doing very difficult things because they're not it's not a simple fix. If, for example, you said we're going to cut the school debt year from such and such to such and such, well, once that's done, it's done, and it takes a major act to reverse it. If you say we're going to drop a coursework on this and add coursework on that, if you say we're going to change class size from this to that, those things have a kind of a momentum works for you in those areas. These kinds of things that involve system change or behavioral change, and by the way, I would say even some of those other things that sound like they don't, they really do, but the more behavioral or, or system change it, it involves, the more reversible it is, or the more erodible it is. And so trying to maintain commitment to something over time is hard. And there are more examples of when it didn't happen than when it, than when it did. You've got to hope, I think, that the, the intervention itself is a big enough gain uh, and the constituency for it is strong enough that it can withstand a certain amount of that. But I do think that that kind of, of change, particularly around political leadership and around the actual, just the, the cast of characters involved in, in their in commitment to something, 
is a genuine risk no matter what. That would be, I would say the same thing, precisely the same thing, if we were talking about change in the United States or UK or France, exactly the same. Yeah. I mean, look, look at all educational interventions here. They'll go for a while, and then a lot of them, somebody just thinks they have a better idea or a different idea, and they move off in a, in a new direction. So, I, so one of the things that I personally like to do when I'm working with people around scaling is to look very uh, tactically at what could be put in place to consolidate the change and reduce the the fees of the, the ease with which it could be reversed. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, remember, a, an improvement doesn't just have to show it's better than no improvement. It has to show that it's better than everything else people could be doing instead. And that's a pretty high bar.